Thank you, Rod. I've had great teachers, um, including you and uh, Juan and Luis and all the, all the guys that are here. Honestly, uh, it's such a great faculty. and I'm honored to be involved. So thank you so much. So as we were saying, we have Jared here. He's fantastic. He's our uh, intrepid spine fellow this year and a whole team with Stefania, Mike, and Annika. So uh, today what we're going to demonstrate is uh, more uh, broader applications of robotics, if you like. So uh, Martin did a fantastic, and Gary, of course, Gary and team. We, Gary doesn't uh, even uh, need to be mentioned because he's amazing. Um, but we're going to demonstrate um, uh, just a little bit more broader application of the robot. Martin did a beautiful job discussing uh, the mechanics of navigation and its reliability. And uh, there are, uh, of course, with technology, all of the issues that come up, for example, with accuracy of the navigation and the practical issues such as skiving and so on, in an iterative fashion get improved. And of course, you know, we, we have different platforms. Um, as a disclaimer, the platform that I'm used to, uh, that we have at our institution, is the uh, Globus Excelsius robot. Uh, but of course, you saw uh, another excellent platform earlier today, and there are many, many platforms that are being developed. So one of the broader applications of robotics, other than uh, instrumentation placement, is really uh, what we can do uh, with the inner body and the disk space. And it's really the next leap, if you like, uh, after just instrumentation. And I think it's in a progression of the things that are yet to come, which is really to combine preoperative, pre-surgical planning of your instrumentation to achieve the goals of your surgery, whether it be indirect decompression or achieving lordosis or as part of a big construct. And, and we know from all of the things that, that we've learned here at SSF, and Chris Shaffrey's talked about it so much with uh, PJK and so on, is that the alignment matters with respect to uh, where the rod is placed in the instrumentation. If, if we create a deficit between our instrumentation, our contouring of the rod, uh, and ultimately the correction that we achieve, that is another factor that's going to add to potential failure, uh, such as PJK down, down the road. So what we have, the setup that we have right now, is that uh, we're demonstrating single position lateral. Uh, we have the uh, patient or the cadaver in a uh, lateral decubitus position. The head, uh, is a, the, the cranial end of the cadaver is here. This is, uh, these are the legs. This is posterior towards you is anterior. Uh, we have already, for the purpose of uh, saving time, we've placed the retractor down. And uh, Jared's done a beautiful job of putting a shim and securing the arm. And we've just started the annulotomy to save time. But uh, what I want to demonstrate is the versatility of the robot with respect to working for single position lateral surgery. So uh, another disclaimer is that I do this prone, um, and for me, prone works, but in many hands, uh, the single position lateral decubitus surgery works uh, great as well. And uh, this is really to demonstrate the workflow that was achieved with the robot, particularly with the difficult, uh, potentially difficult placement of the screws in the lateral decubitus position. Uh, we've done the superior uh, screws. Jared's already placed the superior instrumentation. And now we want to demonstrate um, the inferior instrumentation, the, the lower screws that aim lateral to medial, inferior to superior, uh, or inferior to up in this position. So uh, we'll go ahead, and then, then I want to demonstrate the inner body uh, software and the tools to do the, our disc prep. As you can see, neither of us are wearing lead. Uh, we, I, I hate wearing lead. Uh, you know, radiation is, is a bane to all of our existence as our spine surgeon. It's a necessary uh, evil. Uh, but I want to uh, demonstrate how much we can achieve without it. And then, of course, uh, all, as always, we bring it in for a check at the end to confirm placement of our instrumentation. So go ahead, Jared. Uh, we're going to start at L34. So this is the end effector, um, much like uh, we've seen before. It's connected to uh, the uh, arm. Uh, and robotics, essentially, is just a platform that combines this assistive arm 
to navigation as what you heard. So as you can see from the screen there, um, in this platform, the green crosshairs mean that it's on target and according to predetermined distances between the end of the end effector to the uh, entry point of where uh, the cortex is for pedicle screw insertion has all been measured out and standardized. So at this point, can we have a marking pen? So my typical workflow is go ahead and, and place a little uh, entry point. So what I do is I, I mark um, a little marking point, and I would do the same uh, for uh, L4 here, and I would uh, make an incision in the fascia uh, with a knife and, and go ahead. In this case, we wanted to keep it percutaneous, truly percutaneous. So go ahead, uh, Jared, and um, place the instrumentation. So my workflow is... Uh, to make an incision here with this knife. So what he's doing is that he's making the incision uh, with the knife one way and then he turned the knife the other way to broaden the incision. And he would do that for L4 as well. And he has the option of connecting the two incisions to make it easier to pass a rod down. For example, in, in this, uh, in this what single level case here. So this has been pre, predetermined. So we have previously planned this trajectory. And I want to just uh, say that the, the workflow that we have used is a preoperative CT workflow, where what we do is we require CT scan preoperatively. And he's using the high-speed drill now. He makes micro adjustments all the way down, micro adjustments as necessary to go down the trajectory. But pre previously, we acquired a CT scan, one CT scan with thin cuts, which are one millimeter. And he has the option of tapping. Now, go ahead and tap if you... Kasimi. Yeah. Can you explain the uh, deflection tool and the... Uh, Surveillance marker? Uh, yeah, can you explain that and how it works? If, if yeah, absolutely. Notice, if not someone from from the company to explain that? Yeah, That's exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Juan. So basically, you see that there's uh, two little sort of mar uh, marking tabs or little, little uh, metrics above that box that says DRB and tool. Um, this, the deflection tool is a gauge of the pressure. So basically, as he places, for example, um, pressure on the instrumentation and moves the preoperative pre navigation scan according uh, to where the end effector is. It's a reading, if you like, or a meter of the pressure that's put. And it's important to know that. And the reason is, for example, let's say that you're doing an open case, not MIS, not percutaneous, and uh, your skin is not long enough, your skin incision isn't long enough, the pressure that's placed on the tool or the driver by the skin edges can cause deflection of your instrument or of your driver. So it gives you a guide. So you can see it kind of moving up and down, back and forth. Basically, they've determined, you know, and it's colored as well, so uh, green, yellow, and red. The surveillance is a... Uh, check basically for the end for the DRB or the reference frame. Basically, it just means reference frame that's attached there. You can see it on the screen there. And if you bump that, let's say during the case, and it's easy to do, you know, in our busy case, we can bump bump the DRB. Everything is determined on the DRB, right? That's our reference marker. If you bump it, then it's a good guide to you that there is a problem, and it will be off. And you can see that it's in the green there. So basically, to your point one, these are two additional check features for the robot to make sure that it's staying true to the preoperative plan that you determine. So um, that, that's, that's the, those are the additional features. The, the workflow that I choose is the preoperative CT. You can definitely do an intraoperative O-arm spin and or um, use their new system, the E3D or something, and 
basically get intraoperative CT imaging. You can also do 2D navigation um, with this as well, which I think most people don't because they have access to um, you know, an, an O-arm, for example, or intraoperative CT or 3D C-arm uh, in the case. So Jared's working very quickly here to demonstrate. And, you know, we can have the table. He's a very tall guy, so he's kind of, you know, working extra hard uh, bending his back. But I'm, I'm a short guy, so for me, this is ideal position. And uh, essentially, this helps significantly with the, the downward screw, if you like. Have that knife again? For a second. So D Jared's demonstrating an important point here. So my workflow is to connect these two uh, incisions, and then he pulls the skin one way and then the other in order to widen it. But if you wanted to truly minimize your incisions here, and actually these two pedicles are actually normal, a little bit, little bit wider away from each other. If you did four, five, five entry point, incision entry point, and, through, and four tends to be uh, very close together and ends up being one incision. So for me, what I like to do is a single incision, single paraspinal or Wilsey incision down both sides. And it just minimizes the fiddle factor when it also comes down to dropping a rod as well. So um, we're talking before about um, the, the, the accuracy. Everything is, as you know, is dependent on the accuracy of, of the reference frame and the end effector that arm that he's putting it through, that little slot there, that's called the end effector. And it's an active LED system. I don't know if you can see those LEDs, little bit of LEDs. I'm going to demonstrate them. It's these things here, as you can see, and here as well. Basically, these things have, um, they're powered, so they're constantly sending a signal back to the camera as to where they are in space. So this is that part done. Now, what we'd like to do is to go on and demonstrate the inner body software. So at this point, I can easily just take off the end effect. I don't know if you can see it, but this is me take, taking it off and then moving the robotic arm out of the way. And then go ahead now, Jared, with the lateral portion. So obviously, we place the screws in first because placing a cage will uh, impact the navigation. The, the accuracy of the navigation, yeah, the if you disrupt the disk space uh, parameters by putting, for example, an expandable cage in. One option that you have is that you can connect this uh, arm uh, to, to the, to the uh, robot as well. I like doing that just because it's rigid, and it ends up being a very rigid uh, uh, holder. So, this, for me, is one of the features of sort of enabling technology. As you can see, what's happening is that he's using a predetermined um, guide here. Now, we've, we've placed the, the uh, retractor in its location. And he's using this predetermined, uh, if you like, guide for the interbody as a way of a plan that guides each instrument. So all of his disk prep instrumentations can be overlaid. It's a, and of course, we have line of sight, always have line of sight um, because it uses a camera and it triangulates between the tracker on the instrument, the reference frame, and the camera. So you need that, you need that space. You need that space to triangulate, basically. So kind of we can see that, make the camera see that. There, there we, we go. go. And you break through the annulus on the other side, Jared. Good. Obviously, we're careful. And now a good assistant will help with. There we sure go. Make sure that retractor doesn't come out. Should be able okay. to turn this around. Yep. And he's demonstrating the contralateral side. So basically, the, the point of, of, of all of this is to demonstrate to you that the possibility of reducing or removing radiation is real. And these inner body softwares 
are basically like a clever manipulation of this triangulation of navigation in order to use these instruments to achieve what you, what you want. Now, as I said to you before, my preference is the prone position with these for many reasons, and we'll go into it tomorrow um, with respect to why when we discuss advantages and disadvantages of prone versus lateral. But many, uh, many people really still stick with um, single position lateral decubitus surgery and it works great in their hands. Nice job. Dr. Kazimir, I've got a question for you. Yes. Um, in this uh, single position lateral, if you're supposed to do the L5-S1 A lift, can you let your access surgeon, while you're working on a posterior access yeah. surgeon, do it anterior? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely the goal, right? So, so the goal is uh, to have the access surgeon work uh, anterior in, term, in terms of getting you access while you do posterior uh, screw instrumentation. Um, and that workflow uh, can really be maximized. Um, in our institution, we're, we're you know, dependent on our uh, access surgeons to give that, and, and it's something that we are still working out. Yeah. Uh, we have... Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you, do you have a flying car? What's that? You're like a dreaming with flying cars, you know? Flying cars? Yeah. I mean, you're just dreaming right there, you know? I mean, uh, uh, all of us, we say that. It's like a podium surgeon, you know? You can do everything on the podium, but, you know, having at the same time someone dissecting the front and you navigating on the lateral and putting a... I mean, it's a big deal, yeah? Um, well... You know, I mean, you, you, you're going to lose line of sight and you know, something is not going to work, you know. I mean, I yeah, really, I, yes, but, but you know, you yeah, have to be, be realistic, my friend. Yeah, I think, you know, I, that's why I said in my institution, we're, 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 we're not there yet, Juan. We're not there yet. But, you know, I mean, it's... I don't think anywhere. Yeah, I mean, but I like the question. I like, I like the yeah, attendees' like question because... They're thinking of the possibilities. Not you know? even Martin, that is like a magician in here that can do a lot of <laughs> big deal things. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the, the, the problem is that there's so many different moving parts, right? This is, this is what you're alluding to as well. That, you know, by the time you get the screws in with the navigation right, then the access surgeons in front with the, all the tools and you know, uh, their scrubs and assistants and so yeah, on are going to impact or impede line of sight for what you're doing. I think that, you know, it's not perfect. It's not going to be like they're doing it at exactly the same time as you are. But I do think that what's happening is that we're getting better at it. So, for example, while you may be, um, while they're doing the access, what you may do is start the incision at least anyway, right? And then when you need to bring the C-arm in, they step out of the way, right? Uh, or there's some sort of iteration where you improve the efficiency of that, of that process. So yeah, you're right. Like in the ideal world, um, those things would happen. I don't think we're, we're there yet. I do think that navigation and robotics is, is part of it. I, I think it's getting better, in, infinitely better. I mean, one, when I started with robotics, we didn't have this, right? We were just, it was just literally just putting screws in, which you know, is that enough to have a robot, for example? But, you know, we see incrementally it's getting better and better and better, so. I think, I think to... If I hear that Dr. Pham actually they are doing it, I think. <laughs> I think to convince uh, Dr. Uribe that the next uh, SSF meeting should include a, a single position simultaneous demo to see uh, if the <laughs> flying cars are here. <laughs> yeah. But he makes a good point, right? I mean, he makes a really good point. That is, let's be practical. I mean, I, I, I think that it's just going to get better. So, one, we need you to... Uh, it, it isn't, isn't it amazing, right? So, so uh, one mentions how uh, when, when he talked about laterals, everybody was like, oh, heretic, this is dangerous. Now he's seen somebody take it up to the next level. The, and, and the now, tables have, have turned. And now the away. tables have turned. Yeah. Right. No, so but, but, but so you, all, you all saw it here at SSF. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at, at UC San Diego, the, I, have, I have the benefit, of course, of having residents as trainees. And, and as you're showing with, um, with your fellow, that the placement of screws is now very straightforward. Um, which you allowed him to do. A trial. And so because my, my preference is, um, is anterior to psoas, um, while my residents are placing the screws, I, I'm exposing anteriorly. 
So whether it's L12 or L5S1 in the lateral A lift, I'll gently expose anteriorly. Let's turn around. Well, well here comes here comes the the graft. Yeah. Uh, Big upon here comes the trial. Yeah, this is the trial. So yeah. Navigate a trial, and then we're we're going to see a navigated cage. Yeah. At some point. Yes, we <laughs> we we are. And, and um, then we're going to be looking at after going, this trial going for our so reception. So. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Here we go. That, that News, way. you have two minutes. Two All minutes, right, Jared, let's yeah. do this. Yeah. yeah. Let's here. let's demonstrate. Don't, don't don't plunge. Don't plunge. He's not going to plunge. He's <laughs> he's doing amazing, amazing, beautiful. Wow. He's widening the disc space, and he's making it work. Beautiful. All right. Come on oh, out. Just trying not to put a K-wire into yeah. my hand. Good. There you go. And then now we can get this out. Go ahead. And he, he's ready for the cage. And here comes the flying car, guys. So, um, okay. so it's packed, obviously, with bone graft of your choice. Yep. Is that a corpectomy cage? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This is the inner body cage, right? Expandable anterior, posterior here. Big window, obviously. Um, so I like this uh, because basically it allows me to uh, get into the disc space without interfering with the end plates. And then I can expand. And hopefully it's annular ring to annular ring. And I'm having the annulus rest on this implant. Very good, and then you can bring your hand back as you do it. Yep. And you can see that you have the ability to make small iterations, but like as always, your channel discectomy is going to um, decide where you're going to end up, right? That's true. So, and the whole yeah. anterior. All right, very good. And now at this point, we can. Uh, either get x-ray in, but we don't have time, I think. But essentially, here's this driver. He's able to expand up. And... Uh, see me, like uh, every year, you need to get an x-ray, okay? Yeah. Let's do it. There you go. Perfect. All right, come on in. That should be fine. Yeah, yeah that's good. All right. And then let's take this out. Keep in mind, the cage length is what we were given. Yeah. <laughs> All right, flying. So we put an 18 long. in. And we have <laughs> the alien tool a to take it out. I might just put it in the other side. Thank you. All right, come on in, my uh, friend. Kazimi, can you navigate the, uh, the retractor? No, the retractor is not navigable. But what we do is use the dilators. The dilators are so, and the retractor fits tight fit over that. So one, I don't know if you can see this, for example. So this is the tracker. It does the three things, which is that it tracks uh, the instrument. It dilates, obviously, and it can be a neuromonitoring tool as well. So you can place the neuromonitoring um, probe, yeah, like if you that. like, on this metal part here, and it can guide you. All right. So you know, I wanted to know you. I mean, how you're like giving ideas to the companies, but they can put a surveillance mark on the on the retractor. Yeah. So you can have this bar. You know, I mean, good. Somebody has to make money out of this. All right. So, so uh, <laughs> Dr. Uribe, is that to your liking? The, the, the car is in yeah, the air. It looks beautiful, <laughs> as always. <laughs> if that's to your liking, like Tesla. Wow. Yeah, that's for Jared. Jared deserves a round of applause. Thank you very much. So hopefully, that was awesome, Noosh. Yeah, hopefully, Great job. hopefully you guys can kind of see one more application, uh, broader application of robotics. Thank you very much. Thanks, Noosh. So um, that's going to wrap it up for today, everybody. Um, so there's a nice.